Welcome back to Landing Zone Home. We've all made a significant investment into our RVs and we want to protect that as best we can. We know that covered parking is much better than leaving your RV sitting out in the sun to be exposed. So today we're going to talk about how to design covered parking, some features that I have in place, show you what I've done, talk about some alternatives for parking service and building structures, and stick around to the end because we're going to talk about how much all this cost. I've used this backdrop of my parking area on my video several times and I've had many requests asking about it and what I've done here. So I thought I'd go ahead and put together a video thanks to Lee Henry who kind of put me on the spot and says, I want to know about your parking. So tell me all about that. He was trying to build one and wanted to just get some tips. So this may be a rather long video, but I've broken it down into chapters or in the bookmarks so you can look down in the video description below and click the link and go directly to the section that we're going to be talking about. So let's talk for a minute about why you might want covered storage parking for your RV. Most of you will know, but I want to reiterate that the elements, the sun and the rain and the heat and the cold are going to impact your RV in one way or another. And usually that's going to be on the roof area where the seams are caulked with caulking and as the sun hits that caulking the UV rays start to break down the elements in that caulking and over time it makes it hard and brittle. Caulking should remain flexible to some extent to maintain a good seal and to keep the water out. But as that caulking becomes hard and the heating and the cooling starts to make the caulking condense that's where your cracks and your seams start to separate and water is going to get in. So sun is one thing, heat is another, and then it's all followed up by the rain because if rain gets into your RV, then you may know it right away and you can take corrective action and you'll be good to go. But usually you don't know it. The water is gonna to start to seep into your RV and it's gonna be inside the roofing area, inside the walls, and you may not know it until it's already caused some damage to where you start to see the paneling or some things start to uh, discolor. At that point, you've already got water in your RV and you may also have mold in there. So water leads to mold and mold leads to a very bad and expensive situation. Covered parking is the best way to maintain the value of your RV in terms of resale value. When someone's looking at a pre-owned RV, the first thing they're gonna look for is water intrusion and they're gonna get on the roof and then they're gonna check all of the seams and then they'll have a moisture detector to get inside and check inside to see if you actually have water in the walls. So that's the first way to preserve the value of your RV is to get it inside and get it out of the elements. So first off, we're gonna talk about surfaces and what's the best surface to park on. And let's start right now with the worst. The worst is dirt. Even worse than dirt is wet dirt or mud. Because what happens is that moisture is going to leak or seep into your tires. And over a period of time, it's gonna create your tires to start to separate. So you really want to not park on uh, dirt, grass, wet areas, if you can avoid it. If you are uh, stuck with a dirt area, then maybe putting some boards up under your tires is gonna get you up off the ground and it's gonna keep your tires drier. The next best up is gonna be gravel. And I like gravel because it's uh, cheap, it's uh, lasts a long time, and it really keeps the surfaces dry. As you can see here in mine, I started off with gravel years ago and I have come and filled in with some concrete. I have a little bit of gravel left over 
uh, just as a storage area or a walking area. But gravel will keep your uh, tires out of the water and keep the surface dry, and that's really good. Concrete is what I have here, and I really like concrete because it's easier to keep it clean, although you see mine is kind of littered with leaves at the moment. But uh, it'll stay dry, especially if it's covered, it's going to be dry to be good protection for your tires. It's uh, not all that expensive. There are some considerations you have to have, though, that depending upon the weight of your RV, you'll want to get concrete that's going to be sufficient for holding the weight. Now, this concrete here had some fibers added to it. I'm not exactly sure what you call that, but it strengthens the concrete. And there was a wire mesh that was put down, and even around the edges, there was rebar put in the ground to give it a, a stronger finish. Lastly, there's blacktop. And there's nothing wrong with blacktop. Uh, it may end up giving a little bit over time, it, especially if you have a heavy Class A. The tires may uh, actually leave an impression into the asphalt or the blacktop. And what this will do is uh, it might start to collect water if you're not in a covered area. That asphalt indent indentations can collect water and then again, your tires would be sitting in water and that's not a good situation. But asphalt is a option. Uh, Price-wise, between asphalt and concrete, I think, uh, I don't know. I, maybe you can put some tips on that down in the remarks below because I couldn't find an asphalt dealer or asphalt company that wanted to come out and do a small job. So uh, I went with the concrete and I'm kind of glad I did go with the concrete. So that's your uh, options for parking surfaces. So let's go now and start talking about planning your building. As you get a look at my uh, building, you might think that it's uh, a little bit uh, haphazard, and it is. It was built in phases, actually three different phases. I started off with a Class A RV that was just parked on the concrete slab and I put up enough of the structure just to cover the Class A. And it uh, worked well. Then I came back later when I had purchased a fifth wheel and it was longer than the Class A so I had an extension put on and you might be able to see up there that there's a difference in the roof types the part that's dirty is the extension. Then I came back a third time and put a parking area in for my truck and then this small 12 by 12 workshop right here. So to uh, keep your expenses down, try not to do what I did, determine what you need and then build it all at one time. You might get the best bang for your buck at that point. But dimensions is a big thing. This is really an overkill for this Airstream because like I said, I had a Class A in here at one time and then I had a rather large fifth wheel, about a 38 foot fifth wheel. So it's bigger than it needs to be. The width on this is for just the parking area here under this metal section is 18 feet. And for anything with slides on it, I think 18 feet is going to be a good width because you'll be able to put slides out on both sides of your RV and then you'll have plenty of room to do a walk around there. If you've got something without slides or something smaller such as this Airstream here, you could probably get by with about 14 feet. I wouldn't go too much smaller than that. 12 feet would be the absolute smallest because you still have to be able to back in or pull your trailer or your RV in. You want to make sure you have enough space around it to open up any storage compartments that you might have. So plan ahead. Think about how you're going to use that space once you get your RV in there and then uh, come up with your dimensions. The original length of my building was 36 feet and you can see right here when the concrete changes colors 
that's where I had put the extension on. So an 18 by 36 building is sufficient for something, say, up to about 33, 34 feet at the, at the most. Because you have to keep in mind that uh, even though your RV fits under the building, there's still going to be sun that comes in if it's not fully enclosed. And we'll talk about, you know, the sun exposure and uh, placement of your building in just a couple of minutes. So 36 feet was the original building, and then I added another 12 feet to it to get me out to where it is now. And it's a complete overkill, like I said, for this, but for a, uh, say, a fifth wheel that is 36 feet or a class A that's, you know, 35, 36 feet or bigger, you probably want to go... Uh, 42 to 44 feet in length just to make sure you've got it all under the cover of the roof and then uh, all you have to deal with at that point is uh, the sun that comes in on the ends and that has to do with placement. So let's talk about placement a little bit. When I built this building I really didn't have any choice except to build it running east to west. That's the only way it would fit on my property. And for most of you, you're not going to have a choice either. It's just going to fit in alignment with your home or in alignment with your driveway. But what we're looking at here on mine is the south side. And as far as the sun goes, the south side is the most critical. That's where you're going to get the longest duration of hot sun at any period of the year. So I'm fortunate in the fact that my south side is completely finished off and I do not have any southern exposure. What I do have is I have exposures on the east and the west ends and just about the only sun that I get is here on the east side and that's the morning sun that comes in. And when I had my fifth wheel in here, it would uh, the front cap would get that morning sun and there wasn't much I could do about that. On the west end of mine, what you're looking at the rear back there, it's mostly covered by shade from those trees, and I don't get much exposure at all back there. I'm just thinking that possibly the best exposure you could get is if you ran it north and south, and then you had the extreme southern end of it fully enclosed to keep that southern exposure to a minimum. Maybe you can notice on the right here, next to my truck, the roof doesn't come all the way down. And that uh, was a matter of uh, two things. One being, I wanted to make it a little bit cheaper here on the north side of mine, so I didn't bring it all the way to the ground. And I wanted to be able to walk through that. So there's about six feet there that I can walk through without any problem going between the truck or going back over toward the house and that kind of makes a, a good entranceway. So if you are trying to minimize your expenses, you may want to think about that. You don't have to bring the sides all the way to the ground, uh, but for the, like I was saying, at least on the southern side, I would bring it to the ground. Now I've been talking about metal buildings so far, and we're still gonna go through and look at the roof and talk about that for a minute, but first, there are other options out there. I have friends that have put up what they call pole barns, which are wooden poles like a telephone pole, and then they get some metal truss to go across the top and put either a uh, wooden shingled roof on the top or maybe some metal siding. But a pole barn is uh, really nice as well. I'm not sure which would be more expensive, but I think it boils down to availability which one is available in your area. And when I was shopping, I couldn't find someone that uh, was putting up pole barns and dealing with those poles was more than I could handle because you're gonna need them to be about 15 feet long and that's a lot to handle unless you have equipment like a tractor to handle those. So in your area, don't just think about metal buildings, think about other options, see what's available, look online, Drive around your area and see what other RV owners are doing and maybe you can get some ideas that way. 
The height of the roof is very important. For most of you that have fifth wheels and class A's, you're gonna need about 13, 13 and a half feet clearance at a minimum. And then if you wanna be able to get on the roof while it's in storage, you're gonna need something higher than that. This building here has what's called a 12 foot roof, but that's a little bit misleading. The 12 feet is what goes up to the hip to where the roof meets the sidewall, where you see those extra supports in there. That's 12 feet. And then as the roof continues up and makes its peak, it adds almost another three feet to it. So the roof here is about 15 feet. And there's plenty of clearance for this Airstream. But if you can imagine a fifth wheel in here where the air conditioner is sitting at 13.6, that flag would not be there. There would not be enough room for that flag. And you wouldn't be able to walk on top of it unless you were bent over or maybe crawling around on your hands and knees. So think about the roof. That's very important. Uh, you probably do want to be able to get up there and at least wash it or be able to access your air conditioners in case if you need to clean out some bird nest or clean out some dirt daubers or wasp that build nest, things like that. So this right here is perfect for any class A or any fifth wheel. It's the middle center point is at about 15 feet. I live in Florida and we do have hurricanes from time to time and that was a consideration for me. I didn't want to put something up that wasn't going to last and with hurricanes you just never know what's going to last so you have to do the best you can and this building is rated at 130 to 140 mile per hour wind and that is due to those braces at the top that you can see it's braced every four feet or every rib going up it has an extra brace there It also has to do with how it's anchored. And there's two ways to anchor these. On this side here, I had a concrete slab already down. So it's anchored into the ground with these bolts, which are forced into the concrete, and then they are tightened down onto the structure that holds that down. The other way they're secured is to the ground. When this side was put in, there was no concrete flooring and no concrete slab. So you have these, looks like a corkscrew type of bolt, about 18 inches long that goes into the ground. And then they secure that to the frame here. And that gives the structure a lot of strength pulling from the ground. And that's how they are able to reach this 130 to 140 mile per hour wind capability. The truck parking area I had added on has a uh, hip of about 10 feet, meaning that the roof is starts at 10, then on this side here it goes up to about 12 and a half feet. That's plenty roof clearance for uh, any vehicle you're going to be driving. And then on the back side I put in this 12 by 12 storage area, which just makes it convenient for me. And as time went by, I even uh, installed some solar on it. So I've got solar panels up there and I can use that for backup power. I can uh, plug my RV into the solar system to keep the batteries charged and it works out very well. My metal building came from Cardinal Metal Buildings. I think they are manufactured in North Carolina. Then they were distributed to Bainbridge, Georgia and out to the dealer here in my local area. So Cardinal is one manufacturer. I'm sure there are many others that you can uh, look for online. Now, as far as price goes, it's really going to be dependent on your area. Uh, again, availability. And I know following COVID, there has been shortages on certain things and things that you really wouldn't think to be a shortage on, there might really be. So it's gonna be hard to apply what I paid for my structures versus what you're gonna to pay today. But just to give you a frame of reference, uh, this building that started off as a 18 by 36 cost about $3,500 
plus the concrete. Concrete is going to run, again, depending on your area, it's going to run $1,000 or more. So that just gives you some uh, rough figures on what you might be paying. Of course, that price I just quoted did not include the extension or the workshop or the parking area for the truck. But just gives you uh, some idea of whether or not you want to go in this direction. Well, I hope I answered all of your questions concerning covered RV parking. And if I didn't, go ahead and leave me a comment down below and I'll respond to that. Again, thanks to Lee Henry for asking me to make this video. I think it's a really good idea, especially this time of year when uh, the weather is still nice, but winter is coming and we want to get prepared for that. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and please make some sort of comment down below. That really makes a difference with YouTube in terms of locating my video and offering it up for view to other people. So the more comments I receive on the video, the more distribution the video will have. Click the subscribe button. I'll repeat, click the subscribe button if you haven't already done that. And I will appreciate that. And until next time, thanks for watching.